So yeah, I'm doing this now. I've been playing Valve's upcoming multiplayer online battle arena game, or perhaps a hero seizure, if you will, I like to League of Legends, Smite, and Valve's own Defense of the Ancients 2, funnily enough. I'd be worried about them snapping up their own market share if they weren't Valve and I didn't think they could handle it. I only got in via friend invite like most people, by the way. I wasn't special and got in during the NDA or anything, and it's been an experience I'd like to document. For one, half of my enjoyment so far has just been the sheer vibe of getting in on a Valve game of this early in development. This is a once in a lifetime arrangement. Usually in order to get something like this you have to hack the damn company first, so it's always nice to get these things legally. Despite being a game born of some very trend chasey concepts, the sensation of being in an early in the Valve title really injects a warm nostalgic touch to the proceedings, and all without any gameplay jank. Things are surprisingly stable and fully fledged. I haven't run into anything that I'd consider a glitch, and there's even the ability to view replays, so bravo. Deadlock is a hero seizure played as a third-person shooter, of course. I've heard many describe it as a MOBA that just happens to be viewed over the shoulder, and I'd say it's at least a bit more than that. Smite is a lot closer to that description. The only thing the camera changes affects there is how vision is taken into account and your basic attacks are now skill shots. Deadlock has a bit more going on with the mix than that. It echoes more from the likes of Monday Night Combat and its long-lost super variant of all things. Or Battleborn, if that takes your fancy. All of these games are taken away from us and what Deadlock aims to take over and improve on. The shooter aspect takes much greater effect on its physicality and mobility, aiming is pretty strongly at play, and you can use verticality to navigate the maps and take new angles. And you can manipulate momentum to really tuck and fly, combining movement tricks to maximise your traversal. So that's cool. But it is still a hero CJ at its heart, and matches rely on a laning phase with careful economy management, item building, and macro strategies like split pushing and rotating lanes and stuff. If people are sworn off the genre for various reasons, Deadlock has not magically fixed any of those reasons, it's just the same thing, but now in, in a different context. Well, I guess people can be a lot higher on the third person control, and that's how we got Woody playing the game, so now anything's possible really. This is another game where teamwork is extremely important, but a single player making a few mistakes is enough to ruin things for everybody. A single player getting fed and snowballing is a lot less likely, but people still get angry and point fingers, so not for the faint of heart this one. Deadlock has numerous other formula innovations that I'll get into in due time, but apparently we have Ice Rock to thank for heading up this whole thing, which certainly explains a lot, for one. People whose mental scope of Valve is only TO2, Half-Life, and like, maybe Left 4 Dead, can very easily miss just how wild and regular Dota 2's patches are, so it's only fitting that he takes the design charge on the most motion Valve has had, development-wise, in a long time. It's also very telling that he was finally designing a game from scratch with nothing but the genre's basics and no other preconceived ideas to adapt, and he still decided that random power-ups needed to spawn in the middle of the map periodically. So he really is just like that. And I was like a lot of people, where I saw the initial screen grab from Uncle Dame streaming in a private Discord and definitely felt worried by what I saw, which goes a long way to show why NDAs exist in the first place and why a developer would ideally want information to come out on their own terms. And then, as it became more understood what the game was and what it was like and what it looked like, what they were trying to do, there was a moment of, hey, actually, and part of that is definitely the execution of the game's setting that only gets stronger as they work to finish everything. For what it's worth, I can't imagine they didn't expect this to be how things got out if they were giving people unlimited friend invites from the get-go. Deadlock imagines an alternate history of the probation era of America plunged into a world of the supernatural, spirits, magic, and extra-dimensional demons, and the whole world knows about them. The gameplay is one thing, but the art and writing going into this world are my most looked forward to part of this whole project by far. Valve's artists and writers are some of the best in the business, and I think something like this really fits their charismatic style incredibly well, giving them the most creative freedom they've had probably ever. And I'm really jonesing for some early 20th century Americana right now with twinges of fantasy, so what a coincidence. The character designs, while important, are obviously still due for changes, and I can't really say anything now that more qualified people couldn't say better, but they definitely engage the mind and present a menagerie of the monstrous that a lot of people keep saying they want every time League of Legends dares to add a humanoid to the game. And when I say writing, not only do we have the character backgrounds as a litmus test for how they're approaching this world, if you know where to look, there is a whole surprisingly complete visual novel about one of the characters, presumably meant to be implemented in the game in some fashion. And it doesn't just cover a background or a side story, but actually presents multiple different endings to her arc surrounding Deadlock, which I guess makes her the game's most developed character by default. And if this is the kind of caliber we've got to look forward to, I'm, I'm very pleased. I have always considered the modern work of Valve's artists and writers to be perfect, and I couldn't think of any possible way to improve them. 
And we still got like two years of QA ahead of us before some of the blander stuff really gets nailed down to top form. And yeah, this visual direction is leagues above what they abandoned with the original Neon Prime concept. Not even taking into consideration Concord current events. The cleaner sci-fi mode is in such surplus at the moment, especially with all the adjacent games, and I really do think Valve just do this kind of stuff better. So, mechanically, what's new? First thing you'll notice is the first map we have is a four laner, and along the length of each of them is this zip line you use to travel to and from your base to streamline the process of actually getting there. You can ride this line for as much of the space beneath it as your team controls, which is determined by code that interprets where the median equilibrium is for both sides. If you push up, you are able to take the zipline further along and vice versa. You even get a personal zipline boost on a long cooldown, which is handy for making emergency speedups to protect your towers, or if you get pushed out and want to go to base, heal, and then return as quickly as possible. This is a neat idea by itself, but you can get a surprising amount of extra value out of this with the game's movement, and create some fun mobility opportunities to engage and rotate. Quite often I'll be tempted to just ride the momentum when I'm coming back to lane and dive my opponent as I'm coming towards them to see if I can push them back. And then once you're on the lane, the game reinterprets Dota's last hitting and denying mechanics with this idea that most of you probably know already. So the money in this game is souls, and killing things gets you souls. When you finish off a target, its soul starts sailing upwards and then eventually pops. When it pops, it grants those souls to the player or team that killed it, which you can also hit it out of the sky to either secure it early, or deny its value from the enemy team. This is a unique idea of encouraging space control. It really plays to the strengths of the third-person shooter format, and you even secure the souls immediately if your killing blow was a melee hit. And not just for minions either. If your teammate dies or your tower gets taken, if you still control the space, you can shoot the souls out to prevent it from swinging the economy too much. Handy for when you're doing good, but still just have that one teammate who dies every team fight. And maybe it's because they're not as good, but also maybe just because they're getting focused, but you're okay with it because they're going to be overextended in order to do that, and you just mop them up anyway. Getting denied over and over is not good for the tempo, though, I'll say. You've got options for mobility. You can dash, air dash, dash jump. Uh, you can wall jump now. You can break stuff, and sometimes stat upgrades come out. Oh yeah, and there's... 12 to 16 item slots depending on the current game's date, instead of the usual 6 or so. Three of these are mutually exclusive categories though, and one is a series of gradually unlocking flex slots that can be used for any item. The fact that your first four items in either category doesn't come as a slot opportunity cost for the other ones means you can adapt a lot more between weapon damage, durability, and ability power. This and the current state of the roster's game design means the roles are a lot more fluid between the cast, with no real hard support or carry role. When Battleborn was, you, you know, still a thing, I did actually play it just to form my own opinions on it. And one of my genuine points of criticism I had was that I wasn't satisfied with how the game balanced things between ranged and melee characters. Any hero with a gun would naturally be able to engage at any range, which posed a significant advantage in what counted as that game's laning phase compared to a conventional hero seizure where even ranged heroes had max ranges they had to walk you inside of. Deadlock feels like it approaches this problem a lot better. Well, one, by not having melee heroes at all, although a good share definitely have much shorter effective ranges and have to play closer in lane, uh, yeah. And two, by making lanes thick with cover, ways that you can flank, and by making damage fall off at longer ranges real steep. If you're not in danger close early game, your gun is basically only going to cherry tap people. I guess that's not a factor for spell damage, but spells are generally pretty skill shotty and much easier to dodge. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can melee people, but if you see a melee attack coming, you can parry it. I thought this was a funny and niche innocuous thing at first, but once you delve into exactly how often one could use it, I can't imagine the game without it. It feels really good to be able to turn an encounter on its head with this thing. Melee attacks scale with weapon damage, and you can charge them up to lunge forward and deal more damage, so they can become a surprisingly relevant damage source from characters who need more burst or follow through. If, say, an Abrams is on top of you and wants to introduce you to his favourite build, you can react to the heavy charge, parry him, and get a two second stun off that just lets you wail on him for a bit. And then you start finding other ways to apply it. Guy trying to secure last hits with melees to secure the souls, stand in front of one and parry, back into a corner and out of options, try a parry and see if you get lucky. The Roshan neutral boss th thing that drops the power up you need to break open with a charged heavy. Stand on top of it and parry to prevent it from getting stolen. I've had some fun with it. Then there's the skill point system. 
Deadlock is a bit loosey-goosey for what it considers a level, since the currency is also experience. You have certain soul thresholds instead, which reward you with certain bonuses, including skill upgrades. Rather than the linear increases of effects and scaling, each ability has a sort of talent branch whereby each upgrade step has escalating costs and a unique boost that can add new properties altogether to them, like your spell can debuff an enemy now, or boosts your own cast, or leaves behind a puddle of damage. Let's see here. The rest is mostly map specific stuff like the teleporters, the side shop, the... I don't know, I think I call everything important. That seems to be everything in its best side, so th th there you have it. Now, this is going to be a tough thing to try and say in prediction, and maybe I shouldn't be so presumptuous. Will it be massive? I don't think so, but I do not say that like it is a bad thing. I think Deadlock won't become a part of the great pantheon of esports titans with Dota 2 and Counter-Strike, but I think it'll develop its own cult niche like a lot of other smaller Hero Siege games, just with a healthier player base from the Valve audience. Like, sure, it's bigger now, but because we're in a special situation right now and everyone wants to come up and see the show or grab a piece of the Deadlock content creator pie early, we've got to consider how these things level out once the buzz wears off. Though I will say, it's impressive how since there's no progression system in the game yet, Loads of these people really are just playing Deadlock for the love of the game at the moment. You'll love to see it. But Valve only gave us this arrangement to gather data and feedback. So, to do my part, here's some feedback. Successful parries could do a little more pizzazz. They're huge, they can turn around the whole fight, and it's entirely possible players won't even know they got parried in lower brackets. Some pop-up text like they use for the items, and a louder sound to really drive home the moment should be good. Itemization is the biggest learning curve when starting the game. Items could use some more flavour to make them more exciting to talk about and easier to remember, like better names and cool art. Everything being standardised to the orange, green, purple colour scheme is good for determining categories at a glance, but everything being homogenised makes picking out a specific item more difficult. And I also find that I have trouble remembering what stats the items even gives besides the special passes or active effect, and I think this should take after the way League tables its item stats with the coloured icon legend at the left of the statistic. And also not have the window be a bright solid colour, that would also help. While obviously the release versions will have modes with specific drafts and lane select, the game auto picking your lane for you does mean the obvious of heroes that are good support but below average solo laners having to flip a coin to see if they get screwed that match. But also one other thing, the lanes each have a small jungle camp next to them but only on one team's side, right next to their guardian. This gives a safe quick farming option to that laner especially if they have a good camp clearing ability. But the opponent has to basically win the lane and push their opponent out in order to take it for themselves. The other side usually has a medium camp instead, which is much tougher to take early without losing too much health, and it spawns later in the game. And, 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 and this isn't necessarily a problem by itself, but it does equate to the way the Dota 2 map is built, and how that creates a safe lane where the team has easy access to their jungle, and an off lane where they don't. And there's a similar, if minor, version of that effect here. And some heroes definitely make better offlaners, namely durable characters like Abrams or heroes with much stronger control over lane pressure and minions. Just, just something to think about that may become a later development in the meta to work around. The mechanic where you gain infinite ammo while sliding is neat and theoretically encourages engaging with the movement during combat, but as far as I know, people only use it to do this thing with the stairs in front of the Guardian and uh, a bunch of other very unintuitive optimizations that are very unsatisfying. You could probably axe that mechanic altogether if you needed to trim the fat somewhere. I consider myself a UI maximalist at times, what with being a Final Fantasy XIV player and all, but I have heard on multiple separate occasions someone seeing footage and then going, this UI sucks. The actual graphics are one thing, that's not worth commenting on, we know things will change, but there might be a couple of things you could shift around to reduce clutter. There's this context sensitive stats table on the lower left above the items. I don't know what determines which one shows up and when, but I've never needed to look at it at any given time. Maybe you could hide it until you hold the alt key, have an option for it, or even a little stats button that appears when you hold left alt that pops it open for you. Maybe some of the stuff like team economy etc could be hidden behind the left alt expanded view too. Also this thing, the meter for the threshold bar that determines when you get your bonuses at certain soul counts is this potion thing that they decided to be at the center of the screen and I've ironically never found my eyes to be able to look at it between the actual center of the screen and the corner where my soul count is. It's just a blind spot to me. It might be best tucked away into maybe a smaller bar above your souls count or something. Oh and in-world billboard health bars need some work I think. They could use a border or something to pop them out from the background. But also in Deadlock, as a player gains more max health, the health bar actually expands horizontally and wraps upwards. 
as opposed to some other games which kind of do this to it. This is an alright idea for being able to tell how tanky someone is at a glance, but it's a lot harder to judge their health percentages this way, especially if you're Shiv and need to eyeball how much of their health bar is 20%. Oh, actually, another thing I want to talk about. So there's no support for community servers yet, obviously, but this is a the Source 2 game, which means community maps and potentially community modes. And we already have the Dota Arcade to look at for examples as to the potential of this, just in a format where you don't have full 3D control. Speaking of modes, I think I'd like Valve to eventually look into investing in variants of the map and modes, especially the way Smite does it. It has a spectrum of maps depending on how you like your flavours. It's got 5v5s, 3v3s, and Deadlock would benefit from something like that game's arena mode. It's basically the closest thing to a MOBA team deathmatch, and it's great for wetting your whistle without having to put too much investment or macro strategy into anything, so it's nice and casual. I will watch Deadlock's growth with interest. It's nice that Valve have finally introspected themselves enough to unify their direction and get to this point. And most of all, I hope they enjoy crafting this game and its world. I think they've really hit on something special. Thank you for your time.